Well, listen, Jason Rasnick, CEO of Benzinga, is doing double duty. Not only is he interviewing folks at the other stage, but he is also bringing his talents here to the main stage. And we're ready for an incredible conversation with our very own Jason Rasnick and the CEO and CIO of Eminence Capital and a diehard Wisconsin Badger. Let's make some noise for Jason and Ricky Sandler. Woo, 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 woo. All right, you guys, I don't know. I don't know if you know how big of a get this is to have Ricky Sandler here. I don't know if you know how successful he has been, but um, you do know. Okay, so I'll shut up. But And he hates me saying this because what he just said backstage is who he is. He's like... He like, didn't want me to keep saying that. He's like, I'm a regular guy, and that's what he is. But a regular guy that has a hedge fund that has outperformed the market and one of the most successful hedge funds in the world, you put him in the likes of a Carl Icahn, same kind of terms, and this is Ricky Sandler from Eminence Capital. Welcome to the stage, and thank you for gracing us to the stage. I know how hard we worked to get you here, by the way, so thank you. Jason, thanks for that kind introduction. It was really over the top. But, it's, but, but you, know it, you know it's true. I mean, it is true. No, when I when people they didn't believe me that he was here. Like, I'm, you know, whatever. I mean, but he's here. So, but the thing that you're gonna get today is a different perspective on investing in cannabis. To be honest, he switched my whole strategy for investing in the last six months when I kept talking to him and learning about him. So it's changed me. And I bet when you leave this room today, you're gonna be a changed investor because there's a lot to listen to, and I'm just excited to get into. It. But before I get into it. Ricky, where did you grow up? Like, what's your, um, you know, your youth? My youth is, uh, grew up in the suburbs of New York. I grew up in Long Island, um, where I think a lot of young Jewish people uh, grew up. And uh, basically, I've lived in New York and Madison. What city in Long Island? Uh, Woodmere, one of the five towns. Okay. Okay. And so you grew, up, you grew up in Woodmere, and then did you want to be a hedge fund manager? Uh, no, I, I, I didn't. I actually thought I was going to be a lawyer. I wanted to go to law school, and then I started talking to lawyers when I got a little older. Started talking to lawyers and how miserable that life was. So, got it. And so then you're like, I want to go into finance. So what? So what was your first job like out of college, um, out I, of Wisconsin? I I actually worked for a money manager, Morris Market Mark Asset Management. I was back in the day, you could go to work right out of college for a hedge fund. Um, I got lucky enough to do that, um, and it kind of set me on a path that's been incredible. So how did you, young Ricky Sandler, 22, 23 years old? start to gain credibility as a young money manager? So um, I, I left, we left Morris Marks. Uh, I left with another young gentleman um, and started a hedge fund. We were 25 and 28 years old, kind of called it the MCI Friends and Family Plan. We built credibility by building results and doing what we say, and um, it's been a long journey over the last 30 years. Okay, so you just, as a young manager, you guys, you're doing well, you left with someone else, and that's when you created Eminence? No, I, we, we started as Fusion Capital Management, um, and he and I split up after four years, and I launched Eminence in 1999, so uh, 23 years ago. And how many people at Eminence these days? 60. 60. And listen to this. So Eminence, what's the average, like how long has the average person been at Eminence? Uh, probably the average person's been with us for like, 13 or 14 years. We've had an incredible tenure of people. Um, my my uh, PM, Jason Kirsch, is in the audience. has been 14 years, Jason. 14 years with me. He's, he's our expert in cannabis. I just tell the story. Um, and uh, create a good culture, treat people right, and, and have an organization that people want to be part of. I mean, 14 years at a hedge fund, when I think the average tenure is like three to five years, I mean, there's something you're doing right. But, um, but the cool thing is, we get to jump in their office right here, right now, and get to learn how they invest. So, you know, tighten your seatbelts. So then you, got, you guys have been investing in the markets for many, many years, but about how long ago were you like, I'm interested in this cannabis space? Like, what, what, how long ago was that? So, um, personally, I, I, I made an investment in this space several years ago, maybe, maybe three years ago. Um, and I've always been intrigued. I think as an institutional investor, there's this kind of push and pull about, about when you can and if you can as, as an institution with, with you know, pretty credible clients do that. And uh, we started researching the space kind of early to mid 2021. So we, we've only been 
deploying capital into the space for the past nine months, um, have studied it for well over the past year deeply um, and, and find it fascinating and, and quite interesting that, that I'm probably an N of one um, as a meaningful institution that's been willing to put $500 million into the space. Yeah, so there's no institutional capital in cannabis as um, I, we were talking about yesterday. This is the one of one institutional capital in the cannabis space. So I don't know what that means to you guys. You should clap your hands because no one has been able to, no one supported an institute from an institutional perspective except for Eminence and Ricky Sandler. And we're going to get to why he's doing it in one second. But before we do, you said to me last night, this is the year of the hedge fund in terms of like, are you real or not? Can you explain what you mean to the audience? Yeah, I think um, the, the, the last. 12 years, basically since the great financial crisis, it's been a particularly challenging time for, for hedge funds. I think investor bases um, want both a manager that can outperform the market and, and not lose money, and those two things are not possible. And I think you ended up in a, in a world where um, hedge funds disappointed investors um, and, and investors chased performance. And I think we're back to a world where um, fundamentals, valuation, deep research, all matters. We have a stock market that's you know, run by factors and individual investors and quant funds and pods and, and nobody's doing bottoms up. And, and so we're, I, I think we're back to the, the, the post-99 uh, kind of dot-com bust where, you know, people that can sort through this stuff and, and take a long-term perspective really know how to short um, and, and really are disciplined about the things they do. So it'll be really interesting to see that result. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to go to the stuff that you guys really want to know about. So cannabis. You were talking about how it presents a unique investment opportunity. Explain why. Yeah, so, you know, I think um, our, our investment philosophy is to own really good, durable, growing businesses, but also stocks that are mispriced, and we can understand why those stocks are mispriced. Um, and I think this industry is maybe, um, and, and the public MSO is maybe um, the greatest representation of that that I've seen in my, in my 30 years in the investment business. Um, it's very obvious why there's a huge opportunity in this space um, for people to make money in this space. Not just that the industry is going to grow, but that right now there, there is a lack of capital supplying an industry that has an incredible opportunity. Um, and that mismatch means that capital that is deployed is deployed at an attractive price. I think sometimes people think that investing is a popularity contest. I want to buy what everybody else is buying. I want to buy what nobody's buying because eventually they're going to buy it. And, and I can tell you that I might be the first institutional investor in this space, but I'm pretty comfortable over the next three to five years, most of my peers and the big money is going to be in this space. And so um, while sometimes I think the, the investor base here, they've been here a long time, they could be a little fatigued um, because it's, it's the same group of people. I'm quite excited by the fact that, that other people are not yet invested in this space. Um, I do believe that's going to change uh, potentially this year um, with safe banking passing, but certainly over the next three to five years. Well, and, and the thing that you called it was, which I, this is where it changed my whole thinking, is mispriced assets. So if you can find a mispriced asset in the stock market that not everyone can get exposure to because their pensions won't invest in it. You have a unique advantage. So that's what you were just talking about, mispriced asset opportunities? And look, it's two things, mispriced assets and durable growing businesses. This industry has both. Um, and, and so when, and when you can understand exactly why it's mispriced and why that's going to change, that's, that's another thing that's really important to us. Um, I don't want you to tell me something's cheap. I want, I want to know why it's cheap. What, what are people missing? And, and here, it's pretty straightforward, which is 95% um, of the people that do what I do are not yet invested in the space. That should excite people and not depress them. I know, I know Kevin O'Leary um, said yesterday, cannabis you know, is terrible because no institutions are invested in it. And I think that's the opportunity. Um, we shouldn't want to go where everybody is. We shouldn't want to buy the shiniest object. We, we, we should want to buy the good businesses that are mispriced. So you're like Wayne Gretzky, you go to where the pike puck's going to go. Exactly. And so, and that's a lot of pent up capital that'll be there eventually. So then, the, the, w w what's your time horizon for cannabis? So look, I think, I think we're long-term investors. I, I've been at this business for, for 23 years, and I'm a believer that um, if you think you're going to invest to try to make money over the next six months, that's probably a mistake investment. If you can make money over the next three to five years, those are the great investments. Um, we have a, a ton of duration with our, with our investment partners um, and, and, a, and a ton of duration with how we think about investments, particularly if the businesses continue to grow in compound value. Um, and that's where I think that the large MSOs are exceptionally well-positioned in 
and, and frankly, in an industry that um, is star for capital, the people that, that, that have some of it um, are, are going to even do better. And I think that the tip of the spear is going to have to be those companies doing well, which, which will then create capital to recycle into the rest of the industry. So that leads me into the question where people get to want to know names. He said that leads into good companies. So can you name a few of your or all you, like the cannabis investments that are public that you're investing in? We own four public cannabis companies. Uh, we own Green Thumb, Green we, Thumb, Verano, Terrasend, and Cresco. Terrasend, Jason Wallace. Oh, there you yeah. go. You guys like that? Come on. He owns four public companies. They're all here. Let's go. Okay. The, this is a guy, institutional capital here, the only guy in the market, the only guy. And this is what you do, right? It's like what Sam Zell did during real estate, you know, it's like you, 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 you want to look for opportunity where other people are not. And, and as an institutional investor, um, that's what really excited me. I, I actually think institutions should be a lot more comfortable than they are now. I don't think people have, have taken the time to, number one, understand that if you actually buy public MSO companies, you're buying registered securities, you're buying secondary shares, you're actually not even directly funding a business. So you could be one step back from what you perceive to be a risk. Um, and and uh, that creates, that. that's one of the things that got us very comfortable early on investing because we were not directly funding a business um, that was, was growing, we were, we were buying secondary shares. And I think that would be the tip of the spear where those companies then get revalued higher, eventually capital gets recycled, they can use those, that currency to, to buy others. Eventually we would expect um, uh, full legalization, but, but today um, we think institutions should be more, more comfortable than they are. One of the things I will tell you also, which I think is important, um, we have um, a, a huge cadre of institutional investors of our own. Everything from public pension plans to hospitals to foreign investors, Middle Eastern investors. Um, and not only did we put um, $500 million from our funds into cannabis, but we also launched a dedicated cannabis fund. And then we went out and talked to all of our investors. And I can tell you the reception's been amazing. Um, they, they are really happy that we're invested in. They understand the thesis. They get it. Nobody has said to us, um, you know what? I, I have to pull my money. No one has said to us, I don't like what you're doing. Um, they have said to us, we, we can't invest in your dedicated cannabis fund because that's a line that our investment committee won't cross, but we're really happy you got a really sizable position in the main fund. And so they want exposure, they get it. Um, and, and as an institutional investor running, you know, between seven and eight billion dollars, I can tell you the big money is, is comfortable with you making that investment. I mean, no, and that's, that's amazing. And I know we went over limit, but one or two more quick questions. One of the things I, us new or average investors, do you buy like these cannabis stocks or like a terror send? I own terror send when the market falls. Like, do you take advantage? Is that how you guys do it or use options? Like, I've been in go? the market the last couple of days since the Schumer bill has sort of set pushback, and people think that's a negative. And, and we've been we, we buy more when they go down. You buy more when they go down. Like and that's that's it, the idea. I think I think I think a lot of people think that you know, as I said, investing is a popularity contest, and there's a saying that that some of my peers will say the buyers live higher. When the stocks go up, then people will get excited. We want to buy them before they show up. Got it. That, that's what, so that's what I'm saying. Like, so when you guys saw the market, because I know you said you think the market selling overall isn't done a couple weeks ago on CNBC or something. Not the cannabis, just in general. Do you think the market overall selling is done for the... For the sector? Nope. No, nope. For overall the market. market. No, I, look, I, I think, did a bad I think, transition. I think, I think, I think, I think the over, we, we, we have a cautious investment position in our hedge fund. Um, we're, we, we think there's a real bifurcation in the market. There's a lot of things to own and there's a lot of things to short. That's a unique market. Well, you guys, I don't know if you'll get to them, but I know you said Jason's out here. You do have the only institutional capital, real money from a $6 billion fund. That's one of the most successful funds in the world uh, here and live and in four of the companies that are here. So Verano, Cresco, Terrasen, and GTI. And GTI, of course. So. Thank you, Ricky Sandler from Eminence. Go Badgers, I'll be on your side. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you, thank let's, you. Let's hear it one more time. Jason Rasnick, Ricky Sandler, let's make some noise.